If you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn in it with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. And we're just going to be reading verse 1 to start ourselves off today. 1 Peter 5, if you're using a pew Bible, you'll find that towards the back of the Bible, just a few books before the last one, uh, Revelation. So go just a little before that, you should find the Peter books. In our uh, business meeting on uh, Wednesday night, our uh, congregational meeting, we, uh, we discussed the, the biblical teaching of the church and eldership. And so what we're going to be doing for the next four weeks is using verses 1 to 5 of chapter 5 of 1 Peter uh, as a, a bit of a jumping off point to try to understand the Bible's teaching about eldership uh, in the local church. So that's kind of the goal here. And what we want to do for the next few weeks is listen to what God's Word says and learn from Him. We really believe that as we open the Scriptures and as we ask the Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us, that is indeed what He does. Uh, he shepherds us and teaches us. So uh, that's going to be our goal. It's so just crucially important. Doesn't that sound wonderful? Um, it's so crucially important to be clear on how the church is supposed to function, how the church is supposed to be structured, because the promise is that, that if we go according to God's standards, he'll bless us, he'll take care of us, and he'll make sure that we have all that we need. That's why Paul in 1 Timothy 3 tells Timothy, I've written to you when he talks about eldership in the diaconate, I've written to you so that you will know how one is to conduct himself in the church, which is the household of God. It's not my house. It's the Lord's house, isn't it? And he promises that he is the one who builds his church. And that's good news, because according to the Psalms, we know what it says. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builder is what? Labor in vain. We want to make sure that we're doing it the Lord's way so that through that, the Lord is the one building uh, his house. So let's just uh, read verse 1 here, 1 Peter 5, and uh, then we'll talk about it. Peter says, The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. This is the word of the Lord for us today. Now what follows is an exhortation to the elders. It's pretty clear that Peter is writing to multiple churches in his letter, but he's writing to these multiple churches, the elders in these local churches, with exhortations. That word exhort there in verse 1, it's the word parakalos in the Greek, and from that word we get the word paraclete, which is translated as comforter to refer to the Holy Spirit, because what the Spirit does, he urges, he encourages, he exhorts us, teaches us. And so Peter is giving exhortation uh, to, to the Lord right here. And this is going, or not to the Lord, but to the elders, the presbyters uh, there in Greek. And so these are direct comments from one elder. There in verse 1, he says, I am a fellow elder. But he's not just an elder, he's an apostle. And he's writing directly to the elders themselves in these local churches who sort of, uh, proceed from him. So he's an apostle who is an elder, but these local church elders have a direct connection to him because just like he was a shepherd in the early church, in many ways, elders in local churches are similarly shepherds just like that. So he is writing directly to them. What he says, the content of it in the next few verses, we're going to be looking at a little more fully in the next few weeks. But today, to sort of situate ourselves and to be an introduction to the topic of eldership in the church, we're going to ask four questions toward um, understanding biblical eldership. And so the first question is this, and again, this is an introductory week, and I want to apologize in advance because this is much more uh, maybe teaching than pastoral preaching, which is what I'm aiming to do every week. Um, so if it feels more like this is a Sunday school class, uh, please forgive me. But, you know, there are times when a church needs to just, you know, kind of deal with the content of a what's in God's word with reference to housekeeping, as it were. So our first question today is, what is the context of eldership? The context is very simple. It's the local church as a local mission. The local church as a local mission. And the goal of the mission is first 
to make disciples. Remember, Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. That is to say, evangelize a local, a local region. And then once they come to Christ, disciple them. That's what a local church is. That is to say, they come to Christ in evangelism. And then when they come to him, they join the church. And then you're going to teach them to, to live in fellowship with me. You're going to teach them how to follow me and how to obey my commands. This is just what Jesus said to the disciples, and you see that worked out uh, throughout the book of Acts. And so what we're doing is preparing those who believe in Christ for Christ's return. We are trying to turn their attention to the glory that is going to be coming to them and to all of us uh, when Jesus uh, returns. And by the way, let me just uh, say this. Maybe this is something I could have said earlier but it is, um, it is healthier, and this isn't a criticism to, to any one person, but there's a, a, a phraseology that I hear sometimes um, that doesn't drive me crazy, but I think we just want to be a little bit more accurate. When we're talking about the church that we attend, we should talk about it as the church that we belong to and less as my church, right? And the reason why I say that is because the church is not my church, is it? Church belongs to Jesus. Okay, so let's just be a little bit more accurate. When we when we are talking about the church that we attend and the church to which we belong, let's call it that. But at the end of the day, it's Jesus's church, and this is His missionary outpost where the gospel is going to go into our town. People are going to come to Christ, and they're going to join. But we are here together, belonging to Him. If we're not careful, that kind of terminology can lead us to think. That it really is our church. And so, like, it's kind of my way or the highway. And that's, uh, that's, I don't need to tell you how unhealthy that is. But at the end of the day, we are subject to the Lord who is the Lord of life and the Lord of all. When Jesus talked about the local church, he only did it two times explicitly. And both times that he does it, here's what he, here's what he says. The church is known as the place where the preaching of the apostles occurs. That is to say, the gospel proclamation uh, as it is contained in the scriptures, that's Matthew 16, and it's also the place where loving accountability is practiced as well. That's Matthew 18. So where the gospel is preached and where loving accountability is practiced, that's where you find the local church. That's where you find a local church. That's why Peter can highlight uh, his being an elder um, as a witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. That's because that's the essence of the gospel message, isn't it? Um, Christ's suffering and the glory that that's going to mean for us in the end. That's what the church is. In discipleship, growth in spiritual maturity is the measure of success. Not influence in a town, not numbers necessarily, although we would love to influence the town for the gospel. We'd love if everybody came to Christ. But the measure of success in a local church is that we are growing in him, that we are experiencing spiritual maturity. And therefore, elders, elders, as he's talking about here in this verse, does not necessarily mean older, although it might mean that, and it very well probably would in most contexts, that those who have walked with the Lord for a longer time, have walked with them for a longer time because they've been living on earth for a longer time as well. But it's not necessarily the case that they must uh, be older, but it's those who know Christ and are therefore able to disciple others as well. That might, that's, we're kind of getting into a definition here of what eldership is. Those who are disciples who can also make disciples. Therefore, Paul in Acts 14.23 how about that? Apparently the Lord wants me to read it because I turned right to it when I just grabbed a clump of pages there. When Paul is in, um, is in Galatia, he's been planting churches, and it tells us that he, therefore, after that, appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting. They commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So this is all, he, he plants churches as missionary outposts, and then he puts elders in these local churches. And then later on in Acts 20, when he's meeting with the Ephesian elders, the elders of the church in Ephesus, he this is the last time he's going to talk to them because he's going to be making his journey to Rome. He says, Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. This is Acts 20, 32. 
which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who were sanctified. So here's what he's doing. He's appointing elders and he's reminding them of the gospel message that the church exists to herald. But not only that, the next generation of pastors, they're called to do the same thing. So in 1 Timothy and in Titus, what's he telling these young pastors? Get elders, get more of them, those who can teach, those who can disciple. Call men who can disciple and lead other people to follow Christ because that's the church's mission. The reason why we're here is for the gospel in Newton, right? The gospel in Newton and Sussex County, and as we talked about missionaries earlier, all throughout the world, that's got to be the criteria. That's the context for discipleship. Secondly, who are the elders? What are these men like? Let me just say first who they are. They are not assistants to the pastor of a church, but they are team shepherds alongside of the pastor such that they are all elders in the sense that they all share this pastoral responsibility. So they're not like, it's not like there's, there's one who's a lead and then there's, an, there's assistance, but it's a team of shepherds. Therefore, he is referring to them there in verse 1 as the elders, and then he says in verse 2, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers. So there are team shepherds who handle the word, give themselves to prayer and leadership. This, this doesn't mean that there's no need or no place for mercy ministries and deacon-like work but it's different from what deacons are called to do. And we're going to be talking about that over the next few weeks because I think there needs to be some clarity on that as well. But if you can remember when there was a problem with tables being served in the early church um, there in Jerusalem, the apostles, there's a problem as all these believers, both Greeks and Jews, they're, they're there at these daily distributions where they're all eating together. And there are some people who are being neglected and the apostles, they say, you know what? we really can't be dealing with this because we've got to be preaching and praying and leading. So what are we going to do about this? They elect seven of them to then become deacon-like and serve the needs of the tables and all of that. So we're already beginning to see there early in Acts this division of labor, right? There are those who lead and then there are those who serve. And we're going to be talking about that more as time goes by. But the point is this. The goal is shepherding, leading, and it's more kind of big picture. That's what, these, that's what these elders are about, shepherding and leading. Let me give you another couple of um, descriptors for them. One, they're men. That's not popular. It's becoming less and less popular today. But they're men, um, not just because of what a few isolated verses say, but because the sweep of scriptures is very clear why they would be. Jesus was a man. The apostles were men. Home in God's eyes, if there is a family unit, it is ultimately ideal if the home is pastored, as it were, by the man. And so it makes sense if the household of God would also be shepherded by men too. But that's why the isolated verses uh, each say that. I, the New Testament, like, I don't, I don't want to be a scoffer here, but the New Testament couldn't be any clearer on the issue of male eldership. It just can't, it could not be any clearer. And when we talk about that, what we're not saying is that men are more important. I mean, come on, they're both made in the image of God. But there are, but there are unique responsibilities that men have that women don't and that women have that men don't. And so they complement each other. And when the church operates that way, can I just say, it's beautiful. That's what God wants. It's supposed to be an outpost of the new creation in the world where everything is politicized, everything is an occasion for accusation. In the church, there's not supposed to be accusations going on, but rather everybody is happy with their role. They understand that they have gifts that are necessary for the local church. And that's one example is, is with uh, these men being called to eldership. Secondly, they're godly. If you look at the uh, qualifications for eldership in the New Testament, 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, 1 Peter 5 right here, you are going to find that the premium is on godliness more than giftedness. 
Now, giftedness is important. There's got to be sort of an apt-to-teach thing there. They've got to be able to communicate the gospel. But godliness is the most important thing, isn't it? We'll talk about that a little bit more as this little series goes along. Thirdly, they're able to manage their household well. Let me rephrase that. It's not that they're able to manage their household well. It's that they manage their household well. That's different, right? They actually do it. 1 Timothy 3, 4, and 5 makes that point that, that these elders, because they are called to shepherd and manage the household of God, they've got to be faithful in the small things as well, i.e. back home. That's not, it's not that that's a small thing. I'd argue it's a smaller thing than the household of God in the context of the local church. Godly men who were called to this office, they've got to be faithful there as well, is the point. And then fourthly here, we uh, note that these elders are humble shepherd leaders. Humble. They're humble men. Jesus said in Mark 10, 45, that if anybody wants to lead in the kingdom of God, they've got to be a slave of all. And that is a word that people don't like to use today because of, its, because of the connotations that it has and all of that. So the Bible's today translated as servant or bondservant, but the word is slave in the Greek. And the point is that if anybody wants to lead in the kingdom, they've got to be lowly. They've got to be humble, humble men. Augustine was asked one time, what are the three most important virtues for the Christian? You know what his answer was? Humility, humility. I bet you can't guess what the third one is. Humility, all three of them. And so these these men who are called to this office, they've got to embody that more than anybody else. Of course, they're not going to perfectly, but they must seek and pursue embodying this. I was reading some stuff on church history recently that was talking about how the early church in the hundred years, a couple hundred years after the apostles died was almost ruined by a quest for power. A quest for power almost ruined the early church and destroyed Christianity. And it makes sense why there would be a temptation for more power when you look at the effect that the gospel's having in the world and everybody's coming to Christ and it's in a way that no religion ever had and no religion ever has since then. Nevertheless, people got a little bit greedy, didn't they? And they began to think, oh, we're supposed to take over and we're supposed to get power over the entire world, not realizing that one of the attractive things about the Christians' lives was their humility and the fact that they were lowly before the Lord and before others. Elders are supposed to embody that uh, absolutely and um, without any kind of shame or, uh, or any kind of hesitation. Humility is so important. I don't want to get into this too much, but I, I just want to say that in um, Acts 20, when Paul is meeting with the Ephesian elders, there's an interesting little thing that's happening with the Greek words. There are three words that are used interchangeably, the word episkopos, which is translated as bishop, the word presbyter, pres presbyteros, it's translated as overseer. Usually those words are translated as bishop, overseer, but it also can be elder. And then the word poimen, which is translated as shepherd or pastor. And all three of these words are used interchangeably in that chapter, suggesting that it's not that they're supposed to be understood as different offices. They're the same office. And that's the way that the local church is supposed to be operating. It's just that they use different words to kind of highlight different aspects of the same role. So there's a very clear, a very clear uh, role, a very clear job for these men who are called to this office of eldership. And there are very clear ways that they need to be defined humble, godly men who have the gospel and can help other people follow Jesus and can do so in a leadership capacity. Just like Peter had himself had to both preach and lead, if you look through Acts 2 to 15, what's he doing? He's preaching all the time and he's often having to make leadership decisions as well. He's the one who stops the argument at the Jerusalem council. So he is saying, elders in these churches, you might have to do the same thing as well. In fact, that's what it means to be an elder, is to both have to preach and to lead. They've got to know if they're, they've got to know that this is what they're called to. And if you're not, don't presume to be a teacher, right? That's what James says. It's a heavy, heavy responsibility. Now, 
The third question here, <clears throat> how many elders should there be in a local church? And this is the place where it gets a little bit dicey because there is significant disagreement uh, among Christians, among evangelicals, uh, even among Baptists. Um, and so I, wanna, I, I want to walk through this with a balance of boldness and clarity on one side and hopefully humility and, uh, and understanding on the other side. But let me just say this. The significant disagreement among evangelicals about how many should be in a church is not because the New Testament is unclear. It's not because the New Testament is unclear. It's because either people simply don't know the New Testament's teaching or they refuse to accept it. And so what I want to say is this. All through the New Testament, there is a consistent pattern that wherever there are elders, there are multiple ones, not just one. You can see this in the Jerusalem church in Acts 11.30, and I'm just going to be running through some scriptures here. For the sake of time, I'm not going to read every single one of them. Um, I'd say, you know, you can take notes, look up the, uh, the sermon afterward. In fact, I might include in the sermon email this afternoon when I send the clip um, the time stamp on the video where I start talking about this so that you can know to fast forward there if you want to get these scriptures. But the Jerusalem church in Acts 11.30, multiple elders. Again, Paul, when he's in and around Lystra and Asia and Galatia and all of that, he is calling multiple elders in the local churches. It says in every church uh, he gave them elders. When he meets with the Ephesian elders there in Acts 20, again, it's multiple ones. There are many of them there, and it continues into his letters as well. So Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, that great epistle of joy that we all love to read so much, who is it addressed to? The church at Philippi with the deacons and the elders. There are multiple ones. So Timothy in 1 Timothy 3, it continues. He's the pastor of the church in Ephesus, and yet what does Paul tell him? If anybody desires the office of elder... He desires a noble task, and here's the criteria. He's saying, Timothy, yeah, you're the pastor of the church. Get more elders. You're going to need them in the church. He tells Timothy to do just that. James, in James 5, who was the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, you might remember that he calls for, if anybody is sick in the church, let him call for the elders of the church to come and anoint him with oil. I don't want to get too much into that whole thing because there's probably some teaching that could go along with that. But the idea here is that there are multiple ones that are called upon uh, into this service, which means that there have to be multiple elders in the church. And then again, Peter here in 1 Peter 5, he's addressing the elders who are among those to whom he writes. Again, it just seems to be a consistent pattern. Whenever there are elders, there are multiple ones. There are several. Um, it can't be that these are multiple paid pastors like me in these local churches because, frankly, these churches were very poor congregations. Most of them were really struggling financially. More likely, and I, I take that back, it's not more likely. What's really happening is this. Those who labor in preaching and teaching and those who have heavier responsibilities to lead and rule Rule meaning meaning just leading, according to 1 Timothy 5, 17 to 18. Some of them are paid. Others of them are not. This means that there's a place for those who are serving as vocational elders, and there's a place for those who won't be. Again, you can read in 1 Timothy 5, those who labor in preaching and teaching, those who preach the gospel, those who have a heavier responsibility to lead and give more time to it, they might actually come on staff of the church. But that doesn't mean that they, that they all uh, are going to be that way. This is, um, this is similar to uh, Moses, if you remember, when he was um, kind of getting to the end of himself. And uh, his uh, father-in-law, Jethro, comes to him and he says, Moses, if you don't get more leaders to help you and to hear all of these cases you're going to be crushed under the weight of it. You need help, Moses. And that was good advice from the father-in-law, wasn't it? And so this is also why Jesus, when he calls the disciples, he doesn't just call one, does he? He calls 12. 
And then amongst those 12, there are three who are sort of an inner circle. When he sends them out to preach the gospel to the re different regions of Judea, how does he send them out? Two by two. And then after Jesus leaves, the apostles keep this pattern in mind again. They're in Acts 6 when they're dividing up the labor. There are multiple men doing this as elder-like men, and there are multiple people serving deacon-like, serving the tables, doing ministries of mercy and all of that. And then Paul, as we've already said, he taught it all throughout his letters. Here I think Peter is presupposing it as he's writing in his letters, his letter. I, I'm not really sure why Baptist churches avoid this. I'm not really sure why it's such a, a bone of contention. It's not just in Baptist churches. I know that there are other churches um, that really struggle with this as well. I'm not really sure why. The best reason that I can think of is maybe the fear is that if you have multiple leaders from the congregation who are elders, that maybe that means that the congregation is going to you know, somehow lose its voice or lose its authority or something. And I just would say, if that's what you're afraid of, I get that, absolutely. But that's not the New Testament model. The New Testament model is that the congregation, the congregation um, is, is the structure of government. You have congregational government with the elders leading under the chief shepherd. And we are all subject to him, right? And so if I, could, if I could just be blunt here and say something that's probably a truism that we all agree with, but how I say it might be a little bit, uh, sound a little bit funny. The local church is not a democracy. It's not a democracy. What Jesus says goes, period. And so if, he's, if there are some things that his scriptures by which he speaks to us don't make clear, then that means that it's not really clear. And either we don't move on something or we try to make a reasonable decision based on biblical principles. Or on the other hand, if Scripture is crystal clear on something, it's not a discussion, right? And so I, the reason I say that is because I, I tend to think it's possible that one of the fears that American churches have uh, when discussing this issue is, if we have multiple elders who are leading, then it's not going to be a democracy anymore. It's not a democracy to begin with. The church is supposed to follow Christ, who, who personally, spiritually leads and shepherds his church. And we are all in this together to try to follow him together. Um, we are all going to be seeking to humbly fit in. There's a beautiful phrase in Ephesians 5 when Paul says that you are to humble yourselves one to another. The phrase in Greek is that you are to meekly fit in with each other. That's supposed to be the context for all things. There's no room in the local church for elders who are tyrants and who are demanding that they be listened to, right? That can't happen. That's just not going to happen if the Lord's will is being accomplished uh, in the church. I think that and I've seen this in many contexts before, where on one hand, you've got leaders in local churches who the congregation doesn't want to, doesn't want to listen to, doesn't want to follow, and doesn't want to commission, and they say, they say, you know, basically, you work for us, and you're supposed to do what we say. I've seen, on the other hand, leaders and elders and pastors say, I'm the man of God here, and you're supposed to be listening to me. And in the local church, like how the New Testament lays it out, that is not what's going on. That's not how it's supposed to happen. We're supposed to be saying, we are all subject to the chief shepherd. He's commissioned some as under shepherds who lead and listen. That's supposed to be what these leaders are like. They lead and they listen. They hear because they care about the souls of the sheep. That's got to be the goal. That has to be what we're after as the people of God. So to answer the question, feels like it was two hours ago when I said question number three is this. It was really only 13 minutes ago. Um, wow, that's a long point. So to answer the question, 
actually to do kind of a summary so far. What's the context of eldership? The local church that is commissioned to make disciples and disciple them in a particular region. That's the context. Secondly, who are these elders? They're godly men who manage their households well, and they lead humbly like Jesus said to. Thirdly, how many elders in a church? Multiple if you have them. It's not like if you have a church that's got like, you know, one qualified man and, you know, a couple who aren't qualified and maybe like nine women or something, um, you know, that, well, I guess we can't be a church then. If you have them, multiple, that's the goal. The goal is to, the goal is multiple men uh, leading and shepherding the congregation, if you can. Fourthly, the fourth question is the last one. Are there any elders who have more responsibility than other elders? I would just answer this question by just pointing your attention again to the New Testament, what we find there. Timothy is called as the pastor in Ephesus. He's the pastor in Ephesus. He is called to commission other elders. Chapter 3 of 1 Timothy, you can see it there. But he also, in 1 Timothy 4, is told that he is to teach, to exhort, and to admonish the congregation. That's not something that a bishop does. Like a bishop in the modern sense, you know, who's like over a a body of church, a group of churches and has like an oversight kind of thing. That's not what a bishop does. That's what a pastor does. That's what a local church elder does. And so he has this responsibility to preach and teach, but he also has other men whom he's supposed to call to come alongside of him as well and try to lead them and try to turn them into leaders who can, who can lead and shepherd as well. We might also be able to see this in Jesus' letters to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3. If you remember, he sends these letters to seven churches. And uh, if you look, every single letter is addressed to this somewhat mysterious figure. Each time he says, He says uh, that he's addressing this letter to the angel of the church in this town or that town or that town. And some might think that it refers to an actual angel. Uh, It seems like the angel that he's referring to is the pastor of the church. Because angels in Greek, angelos, it simply just means messenger. And it makes more sense that he is calling on these pastors, the one who are the primary teaching elders, preaching and teaching elders of the churches, to take the message that he has for them and then tell the rest of the congregation. And doesn't that make sense because pastors are just so angelic, right? That's a joke. Um, But his his point, you know, his point is, is that these men, there are some men who are called with particular gifts and calling to preach and teach in a way that maybe others aren't. And it's not that they're more important than any of the other elders, of course. But it's that there's there's this unique sort of complementary team thing that's going on. And when that happens in the church, the church is beautiful, the church is redemptive, the church is accessible. This is the New Testament model. This is what he wants to see happen uh, in his church. So... So that's why, that's why I'm on staff as the, as the senior pastor of the church is so that I can give my full attention to the gospel. And yeah, there are other things that I do. I teach on the side, but even that's gospel-oriented as well. I'm working on the doctorate on the side, but that's gospel-oriented as well. You know, I'm, I'm on staff so that the fullness of my attention can be given to the preaching and teaching and advancement of the gospel in our region and throughout the world as well. But there need to be others as well. There need to be others, other men who are qualified who can lead in discipleship in an official role as well. Even if they're not going to serve in an official role, even if we wouldn't make this kind of transition to a, to add this category of lay elder into the church, shouldn't we all agree that our goal as a church should be the training up of men and women who can disciple other people? But especially, especially men who have a responsibility to wield the sword of the Spirit and to 
help others to follow the Lord. Let me just say a couple things by way of conclusion here today. And I appreciate your patience as we're dealing with um, some pretty heavy stuff. There's a lot of content here today. Um, this isn't the kind of message that I usually like to preach very often because I understand it's not really pastoral. I don't have any illustrations, no like warm C.S. Lewis quotes or anything today, but there is a place for a time like this where we just, we just hopefully listen to God's word and wrestle through um, what he says about the structure of his local church. Let me just say a couple thoughts by way of conclusion. God's commands are not burdensome. His commands are not burdensome. It's very simple. If we go his way, he's going to bless it. His way is the way of life. Our life in Christ consists of our abiding in his word, right? I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, you'll bear much fruit. Our eternal life consists in our abiding in his word. And the spirit of God is here to help us and to empower us. And when we feel powerless to go the Lord's way, that's when the Spirit comes and reminds us, ah, oh, you might be powerless, but I'm not. I can help you. In fact, that feeling of powerlessness, that's the work of the Spirit as well, because He wants us to remember how much we need Jesus, who's there for us. When the church, when a local church considers adjustments to its structure and to how things operate, based on Scripture, it can be a little scary. It can sound a little bit scary, a little bit uncomfortable, and all of that. Frankly, it would be sin to respond and say, we've got to maintain the status quo how it's always been. It would be sin to say, we must just always do things the way that we always have. The way of godliness is to say, okay, even if I'm not listening to pastor, what does the Lord want? That's what, that's what I'm after here. I want you to just be saying, what does God want? What does he want his church to look like? How does the church function? That's got to be what we're after. And you might say, well, because this is one of the things that I've heard many times over the years, pastor, how things, how things are going right now and how things are operating right now, this works works. So why would we change something that doesn't work? If it's not broke, why do we need to fix it? Let me respond to that with maybe maybe a little illustration that, that well, it's just if you're a single person, if you're a single person and life is going well and you're generally happy, but then you meet that person who you're going to marry, and it's very, very clear that that person has been put in your path by the Lord, you don't respond to that by saying, life was going fine before. If it's not broke, then why do I try to fix it? Instead, what you say is, okay, things were fine before, but this is God's will for me. This will be even better, and I'll bear even more fruit if I go his way. And I'm not saying that church structure changes in a local church is the same thing as a decision to get married. But I think you get my, illust my illustrative point. The point is this. We don't, we don't respond when the Lord makes his way clear by saying, it seems like everything's fine as it is, so let's just keep it that way. Instead, when he brings his word and his will to bear on us when things are going well, the thought should be, oh, so maybe the Lord has something even better for us. He wants to take us even further and take us even deeper. And the promise is that if we follow him, we'll bear much fruit. So I just would implore you, um, I just would implore you to pray, seek the Lord's will, and let's see what the Lord will do in our midst as we continue to follow him and subject ourselves to his guidance, his leading, his shepherding. Well, let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, we thank you today uh, that you are the shepherd, and I'm not. 
Neither are any of us. You are the one who you're leading us, you're guiding us, you're shepherding us. You're using the words of a pastor, the hands of those people who serve in the local church here, and we're so thankful for all of those here who serve in various capacities, how important the various ministries of our boards are, our deacons, our trustees, our deaconesses, the various committees, our clothes closet, our food pantry. This is all your working through us to advance the kingdom and to serve. It's wonderful to be a part of. We give you praise that we can be. So Lord, we pray that you would lead us further, take us deeper, and have your will in our midst. Because we believe that you have a global goal to advance your kingdom. And we believe that we are called to bear much fruit and that our fruit would abide. So we pray that you'd have your will in our midst. I pray that your word, again, would not be burdensome to us, but that simply, plainly, uh, we would seek to be obedient to the scriptures as we follow the Lord's leading by his spirit. We pray all that in Christ's righteous and matchless name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your bulletin...